Greetings fellow adventurers! Embark with me on a Christian perspective of Bhutan, delving into the depths of the land of the Thunder Dragon. This is a continuation of our series as we alphabetically explore the many wonders of the world that the Lord has created. After much research into Bhutan's country, their religion, and their cultural practices, as well as the best places to visit, I think after this episode you will be more than prepared to potentially visit um, and know what to add to your to-do list and itinerary. So let's go ahead and dive in. If you've never heard of this country before, let's find it on a map. Bhutan is located in the Southern Asia region. It borders China and India and is slightly smaller than the state of Maryland. The coast boasts of diverse ecosystems, including subtropical plains, temperate forests, and alpine meadows. Now, when I was when trying to think of a Bible verse that would go well with this country, the one that came to mind came from Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. This country is unique in that really there is no percentage of Christians that live here. It's largely Buddhist and Hindu. And despite that, it still has many beautiful wonders and we can still appreciate it and visit it, um, but it's important to remember that God's creation still praises him um, even in this nation. With this, I have a couple of reflection questions for Bhutan. I actually really struggled to narrow it down to just one question, so these are a number of things that you might find yourself pondering, um, and some of them have some little known facts that I thought would be good to just help you prepare to visit Bhutan. The first one is Bhutan focuses on gross national happiness rather than material materialism, something our Western culture really appreciates. We're all about um, the materialism. So what lessons does this provide and what deficits might it have um, when it comes to how we live out our Christian walk? Another thing, how does Bhutan's history as a close kingdom that only recently opened its borders to outsiders shape the local perspectives that we might encounter when visiting this country? What modern conveniences and freedoms do we take for granted that are still emerging in Bhutan, and how can we be sensitive to bridging that gap? And then how can we build relationships with locals in a culture that might be more reserved? What hospitality and jo generosity can we show? Instead of just expecting to receive it from others, how can we also show it to them? So with that in mind, let's go ahead and dive more into the cultural context, um, history, and other elements of the region. So the language for this country is called Zonka. That's just fun to say. And um, they actually have many English speakers in urban areas. They have a lot of rich history and respect for their elders. Um, they really emphasize showing humility, and a lot of that comes from their religious beliefs. It's customary to greet people by saying namaste um, and removing your shoes before entering your, someone's house is a sign of respect. Um, and this also goes for entering any worship area. It's important to dress modestly, especially when visiting religious sites, and that means covering your arms and your legs. Um, and then avoid pointing at people or others with your feet um, or touching someone's head. The, um, those can both be very disrespectful things. Now, in terms of their religious makeup, Bhutan is constitutionally a Buddhist country, but there's a significant Hindu minority of 23%. Christianity was introduced in the 17th century, but it really just didn't stick. The Bhutanese government mandates separation between religion and um, politics, and they have strict laws reinforcing religious speech, written communications, 
um, or other things that might incite religious discord. However, in the last year or so, there haven't been any reported um, pressures felt by religious minority groups. So uh, take that with a grain of salt. So as in previous episodes, I really believe that when we travel, even in our leisurely travel, we need to not only understand this context of the country, but we also need to understand what it is that they predominantly believe. And as they are primarily Buddhists, we're going to spend some time exploring the history of how Buddhism came to be um, and what some of their primary beliefs are. So Buddhism actually came from Prince Gautama Buddha, which I didn't realize he was a prince, but he gave up his title, his wife, and his son to discover inward satisfaction, um, likely because of just having things handed to him to the whole for his whole life, he was struggling to find meaning, um, especially from observing others. So he trained with monks um, at asceticism and austerities and still wasn't finding peace. And so he realized that the only way to really discover peace was through wisdom. So having given up the hard work of self-discipline, he sat under the body tree and finally reached peace in an ever-changing world, which Buddhists call enlightenment. I want to pause here and tell you that this information comes from a book called The Christian Difference. Um, in no way am I like um, affiliate or promoting the sell sale of this book, but it's been a great tool um, trying to understand the different cultures um, or religious beliefs around the world and how um, as Christians we can connect and speak into their lives. So. Um, I'm basing a lot of the, my information um, on that, and I know I'm not an expert, but uh, hopefully it can help you. So continuing on, so he reaches enlightenment and uh, his disciples follow him. In many ways, he teaches a little differently to each group um, based on their status, level of education, different things, um, and eventually he passes away. And over the years, many different denominations kind of branch from his or original teachings um, uh, into what are known as the four main ones. So the original group was uh, called Ther Theravada. Um, they believe that Buddha is more of a state of being that can be achieved through self-discipline and training. These people often left their families and everything behind to reach this state. Now, the next generation just really didn't agree with this. And so the Mahina, uh, this group allows for people to stay home um, instead of forsake their family. And they, uh, kind of the Christian version of, well, the Buddhist version of evangelism, part of their belief is helping their neighbors to share the message. Um, and their view of Buddha is as an eternal and an immortal wisdom um, rather than a state of being. And the prince, Prince uh, Guatama, was his mortal form. There's another group that's called the Vajrayana. The book didn't go too in depth on them. And then there's another one called um, Esoteric Buddhism. This group stresses sensation over intellect, which is interesting because I think um, when I think wisdom, I think intellect. Um, and that was kind of Prince Buddha's thing. But uh, so they stress sensation over intellect and they believe that wisdom can reach a man directly so long as he is in a meditative state. So um, that knowledge that Buddhism um, can provide is comes in a meditative state. <coughs> When it comes to scriptures, there isn't like in, in Christianity, we have what we call the canon, the, the group of scriptures that we say this is God's word um, and then other things are disputed um, and not part of it. Well, there isn't a, an agreed upon canon um, because his the writings weren't really written by Buddha. They are they call them the three baskets uh the summary of his teachings uh 
the commands that his followers were told to keep and the commentaries on the two. So those are the three main groups of reading, uh, teachings. And Buddhism is such a cultural thing. It's based on the community in which you live. It's more of a way of life in many ways. So even within different regions of Bhutan, people practice it so very differently um, and we'll turn to different uh, pieces of scripture for that. Um, for going on, so some of Buddha's teachings is that everything that goes on around us is dependent on other things. So if something happens uh, to you, it is because something else happened. Kind of like the only way I could buy a potato at Walmart uh, is because the farmer planted it and then the other guy brought it in a semi and like everything is connected, but it goes into a much more of a spiritual um, like karma situation. Uh, they believe that there is an evil cycle to life. It is the repeated rebirth. I don't know about you, um, but when I first hear the word like reincarnation or people who believe that we are born again is different things um, and, uh, until we reach this uh, enlightenment, I feel like my initial reaction before I did this research would have been, well, then I can live however I want in this life. Um, or like that, woo, this is exciting. I could live as so many different, like, obviously I'm not, I'm a Christian. I don't, I don't believe this, but you know, like that would be the mindset, but they actually believe it's very evil. It's an evil cycle of repeated rebirth, which happens when, um, until someone reaches what they call nirvana and that quenches the fire of karma. So every action has an equal and opposite reaction kind of thing. Uh, you do something bad, something bad will happen to you. You do something good, something good will happen to you. And so you will keep dying and being reborn until you can live this absolutely perfect life and go to Nirvana, which is kind of like their heaven. There are what they call the four Dharma seals, which is the world is ever changing and transient. No single substance is eternally unchanging. Everything in the world is suffering and Nirvana leads to a peaceful state of mind. They have what they call the four noble truth, truths, which are, there are four fundamental sufferings, birth, aging, illness, and dying. There are four incidental sufferings, which are separation from loved ones, association with the unbeloved, not getting what is wanted, and just life itself. Uh, there is the truth of cessation, which is the end of something. So the truth of the end of suffering, the truth of the way that leads to the end of suffering. And then they also have something that they call the noble eightfold path, which includes the right view, the right resolve, the right speech, the right conduct, the right livelihood, effort, mindfulness, and meditation. So understanding that, we, what can we take from that? Well, a large part of their belief system is that life inherently is suffering. And as Christians, we can kind of relate to that. We live in a broken world. But um, we also have a hope in Christ. And so things are a little different. And I recently visited Cambodia, which is not the same as Bhutan, but they also were Buddhist. And some of the things that we were taught is that uh, if you're wanting to have some talking conversations with them, it's better to start with the Holy Spirit, one who offers eternal peace, um, peace even in this life, rather than talking about Jesus first, because that is a very Western ideology to them. Jesus can kind of come later, but they can better relate to the Holy Spirit. Um, Another thing is to be very sensitive about the fact that in their Buddhist belief, especially because it's a moral teaching and it, it's kind of a way of life, their identity is often a part of the community they belong to. And the harm of unity of the community, that is one of the worst sins. So it's very hard for them to begin to understand or even think about leaving their belief. So be sensitive to that um, as you uh, get the opportunity to share with them. And then also try and seek to understand what branch of Buddhism they are in. 
not only just of the four, but also how they live that out because that it does mean and look different for every single person. Um, and then another area that can be a good starting point for conversation is to address work. Um, how work can never truly save them. A large part of their culture is understanding that there is a balance between I want this and need this, um, but sometimes it isn't always best to get the material things. Um, and sometimes you have to take a step back, but there's harm on both sides of those lines. There's harm in poverty and there's harm in wealth. So they try and walk this narrow metal road and that also kind of uh, applies to work as well. Um, and they're trying to achieve this level of perfection that we just can't achieve as humans because we are all sinful and broken and in need of a savior. So now that you've gotten to learn a little bit about what they believe, how you can connect with them, be respectful of their culture, etc., let's actually go and explore some of the unique sites that are in Bhutan. So the first place I want to share with you is called the Tiger's Nest Monastery. And while this isn't Christian in any way, it is still a really unique architectural feat and one I uh, encourage you to at least visit um, just to better understand what they believe. So it's actually perched on a cliff and it's an iconic monastery offering breathtaking views and it's significant to the Buddhist pilgrimage. Uh, legend goes that the prince uh, flew to this site on the back of a tigress and meditated in the in the cave for three years, three months, three days, and three hours, so that he so that he could subdue evil demons that lived in it. And since then, the cave has become a sacred site and important to Buddhist pilgrimages. The next place I recommend visiting is called Punaka Zon, and it's known for its beautiful architecture and serene surroundings. It's the second oldest and the second longest Zon, which is a fortress monastery in Bhutan. Again, no Christian ties, just something to better understand their history. Another place to visit is called Tampu. It's the capital city, and it's a mix of both modern and traditional Bhutanese culture. Bhutanese culture, my apologies. It has bustling markets um, and the National Memorial Chorton. Bumpan Valley is the cultural heartland of Bhutan with historic temples and monasteries, um, uh, including a couple different temples. And then the Ha Valley is a picturesque valley that is home to uh, Laharkin Karpo, apologies if I mispronounce that, um, and its temple. And it's a less visited gem, uh, still offering stunning landscapes and cultural experiences. So some unique destinations uh, to add to your site or to your itinerary if you choose to visit. And as always, I always encourage you when traveling, especially in leisure travel, to be thinking of ways to incorporate your faith into your travels. So here are some different ways you might consider doing that. Um, you could pray for the country, focusing on its education, unemployment, and poverty. Um, you could take moments to reflect on some of the things that they are wrestling with in their own uh, religious backgrounds and question how does that pertain to us as Christians. Um, also, I always encourage you to journal, take uh, notes about little God moments that happen along the way. Um, and while I don't know that you'll necessarily find a Christian church to attend, um, at least uh, finding an online worship service to uh, still participate in while traveling um, is a good way to stay connected to the Lord. And I know I started off with four um, questions as we began this podcast, but in conclusion, I have one to maybe take with you, especially if you choose now to go to Bhutan, and that is... How can the peaceful rhythms of Bhutan 
uh, impact your faith walk? Can they refresh you in the midst of a hectic travel schedule, in the midst of your uh, busy life? What lessons might the Lord be using, even in a different religion, um, in a different lifestyle, to teach you about the kind of space and way of connecting with others that the Lord calls us to? So. Um, definitely something to consider. Um, I hope that you've learned something unique about Bhutan, Buddhism, and the, the ways that we can worship the Lord while traveling. Um, I invite you to visit christiantravelers.net to find other Christian travelers who might want to visit Bhutan with you. Um, and uh, of course, I'd like to end us in prayer. So would you uh, join me? Dear Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to explore this unique country. Not only does it have unique wonders that speak of you, but it's also a country that doesn't know you as their savior. Um, so Lord, we just ask that the gospel message may be brought there and that any of the travelers listening today may find some encouragement to shine your light uh, in their adventures. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, Christian travelers, I hope that you have enjoyed today's podcast. And until next time, safe travels and God bless.